Next up is a friend of mine. Uh, she is, I personally think, a dynamo of energy for positive, positive good in this world. Uh, Nancy Pearson is uh, the former board president and current director of ArtSpeak. Uh, in case you don't know what that is, it's the uh, City of Portsmouth Cultural Commission. You can check it out at arts-speak.org. Um, Nancy has uh, spent the last 10 years in uh, arts administration and uh, most recent ran for city council for the city of Portsmouth and won. <laughs> so, so we get to hear from a city councilor elect here tonight. Um, and although Nancy has dabbled in everything from playwriting to glass blowing, which I will be asking her about, her real passion is in creating and managing programs that introduce, educate, and connect the community and the arts. Warm welcome for Nancy Pearson, everyone. Hi, so turns out running for office while um, renovating your house is time consuming and I was really glad to have this as a diversion, but I am gonna be working off of a script tonight because I did not have the bandwidth for that, so. And I do wanna say I am not an artist in any way, sadly. The intersection of arts and public service is very personal. For me, the arts are not an add-on or something nice to have, but the fabric of my everyday life. And the arts are my portal, the, the lens through which I view the world and everything in it. Um, one way or another, I think everything is connected to the arts. I think my arts awakening began with my parents' stereo, which looked like this in the 1970s. My parents had records, a lot of records, jazz, folk, classical, Broadway musicals, the Rolling Stones, and of course, Beatles records. And um, I spent hours lying on the living room floor listening to music, album covers spread out, memorizing every photo, every word of every Beatles album ever recorded, or at least every Beatles album we had. And Beatles music had a profound effect on me. I think I was around eight or nine when I married John Lennon. On Saturdays, my family cleaned the house and listened to opera. For a child, this was obviously sheer torture. My job was the dusting, so through Italian tenors and screeching sopranos, I dusted. This is an association I still can't shake. Today, even the thought of Lemon Pledge makes me think of La Traviata or Tosca. When I was young, I drew and I colored and I painted with any material I could get my hands on. I loved the idea of color and the subtle differences in the hues, lime green, neon green, pistachio green. Uh, I'd arrange my mediums into different color stories and I was oddly satisfied with the warm and cool palettes I created. Uh, this is a family friend, David. He was older than me. He was fearless. He was actor, trendsetter, outrageous comedian. He had an eye for design and an intrinsic, um, uh, uh, he was drawn intrinsically to aesthetic beauty and his influence is in my DNA. At the beach, David picked armloads of beach roses and seagrass to decorate his sandcastles and he'd gather um, seashells to use as pavers and driftwood families would peer out of sea glass windows and I was in awe by his creations. If marrying John Lennon taught me that musicians could also be poets and painters and filmmakers and revolutionaries, then David taught me equally important things like fashion and the drama club in high school and how to worship Barbara Streisand, America's one true queen. We were kindred spirits, David and I, sister and brother from another mother, each black sheep in our families. I was awkward, duh but creative and with a vivid imagination. David was gregarious and fabulous, the first to follow pop culture trends and boldly, fiercely paving, paving the way out of suburbia. On Christmas in 1989, David died of AIDS. He was 28. David had become a high-end floral designer in Boston. You can imagine the backdrop of his funeral, ribbon, ivy, white candles, a friend sang Patsy Cline, cascades of winter blooms adorned his casket. Even ravaged by AIDS, David made death beautiful. 
that losing David was unbearable, and one way to make sense of it was by seeking out art. This is the burden of the artist, I think, to see what others can't. This image by Christine Webster captures the performance of a dancer mourning his friends who had died of AIDS. The Butterfly is a poem by Pavel Friedman, a Czech poet imprisoned in the concentration camp at Terezin. Its last lines are prophetic. I never saw another butterfly. That butterfly was the last one. Butterflies don't live here in the ghetto. Pavel died at Auschwitz. Artist Peter Brooks created this political cartoon, Map of Africa, in 2011, a commentary on the food crisis that has gone on for so many decades that it is at times forgotten. This is the burden of the artist. This is a painting by artist Peter Saul, titled Typical Saigon, 1967. Upon close inspection, the hot pink burnished surfaces belie the horror of their subject. Bodies torn open by bullets, women bound and violated, blood spattered and limbs severed. People think Godzilla's campy, right? A guy in a lizard suit stomping on buildings, but his origins are dead serious. Godzilla was a creative response to the atrocity of nuclear war, fresh in the minds of millions of Japanese citizens. Artist David McKean's painting of the Twin Towers as mourning totems is haunting. The painting, titled Reason, shows two stone figures covering their ears, no longer willing to listen to reason. This is the burden of the artist. Artist D.M. Brinley painted a visual commentary on the heroin epidemic ravaging the least likely corners of America, like bucolic New Hampshire. A literal illustration of how the epidemic is not an urban, race, or class problem that can easily be swept aside as other. In Portsmouth, a community came together to right the wrongs of the past, perpetrated against those who had no voice. Through public art, Dignity was restored to Africans and African Americans enslaved right here in Portsmouth, forgotten beneath the African burial ground. I get really frustrated when people dismiss the arts or treat art as an afterthought or want art to be pretty or cut funding for the arts or try to censor art. Sure, love can be about something beautiful, love, joy, a sunrise, and art can simply be beautiful, but it doesn't have to be, and it doesn't need to be. Art is a mirror that doesn't just show us the beautiful, but everything we hold up in front of it, our own mortality, the death of a friend, a war, even a city's identity. Jim Daly, former mayor of Chicago, said it best. Politicians don't bring people together. Artists do. Thank you.